Today's scripture passage will be Rome, or not Romans, Proverbs chapter 24. So you can turn to Proverbs 24. Be not envious of evil men, nor desire to be with them, for their hearts devise violence and their lips talk of trouble. By wisdom a house is built, and by understanding it is established. By knowledge, the rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant riches. A wise man is full of strength, and a man of knowledge enhances his might. For by wise guidance, you can wage your war, and in abundance of counselors, there is victory. Wisdom is too high for a fool. In the gate, he does not open his mouth. Whoever plans to do evil will be called a schemer. The devising of folly is sin, and the scoffer is an abomination to mankind. If you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. Rescue those who are being taken away to death. Hold back those who are stumbling to the slaughter. If you say, behold, we did not know this, does not he who weighs the heart perceive it? Does not he who keeps watch over your soul know it? And will he not repay man according to his work? My son, eat honey, for it is good, and the drippings of the honeycomb are sweet to your taste. Know that wisdom is such to your soul. If you find it, there will be a future, and your hope will not be cut off. Lie not in wait as a wicked man against the dwelling of the righteous. Do no violence to his home. For the righteous falls seven times and rises again, but the wicked stumble in times of calamity. Do not rejoice when your enemy falls, and let not your heart be glad when he stumbles, lest the Lord see it and be displeased and turn away his anger from him. Fret not yourself because of evildoers, and be not envious of the wicked, for the evil man has no future and the lamp of the wicked will be put out. My son, fear the Lord and the king, and do not join with those who do otherwise, for disaster will arise suddenly from them, and who knows the ruin that will come from them both. These also are sayings of the wise. Partiality in judging is not good. Whoever says to the wicked, you are in the right, will be cursed by peoples, abhorred by nations. But those who rebuke the wicked will have delight, and a good blessing will come upon them. Whoever gives an honest answer kisses the lips. Prepare your work outside. Get everything ready for yourself in the field, and after that, build your house. Be not a witness against your neighbor without cause, and do not deceive with your lips. Do not say, I will do to him as he has done to me. I will pay back the man for what he has done. I passed by the field of a sluggard, by the vineyard of a man lacking sense. And behold, it was all overgrown with thorns. The ground was covered with nettles, and its stone wall was broken down. Then I saw and considered it. I looked and received instruction. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you like a robber and want like an armed man. Thank you, Rachel. Some of y'all got really excited when you heard her say, turn to Romans. And so um, we only have seven weeks. After this morning, seven weeks left um, in the book of Proverbs. And so that makes some of you really, really happy. Um, but um, we are getting through this. This is, uh, our original plan was to kind of preach um, through the first nine chapters um, of Proverbs, just like we did, and then to take, I don't know, maybe about six to eight topics um, after that uh, that are prominent in chapters 10 through 31, and to preach through those more topically. And so that would have meant that our sermon series in Proverbs would have been over like four months ago. Uh, but instead, about halfway through, we kind of called an audible, changed plans, and here we are. We're still in Proverbs in chapter 24 here this morning. And if you remember, um, really going for, off of last week and what we talked about last week, 
We're in this section of Proverbs that's commonly known as the 30 sayings of the wise. And if you remember, this section began in chapter 22, uh, verse 17, and it extends through chapter 24, verse 22. And then in verse 23 of chapter 24, uh, there's five more sayings of the wise that are, that are added on just for, just for good measure. And so there's really 35 sayings of the wise, but um, technically there's 30. And then uh, Solomon just threw five more in there uh, because I don't, I don't know why. But um, we don't have time this morning, obviously, to, to walk through every one of these um, wise sayings here in chapter 24. There, there's 16 of the, of the 30 sayings of the wise are here in chapter 24 here this morning. But what I want us to do is really hone in on one of them. Not all, not all 16 of, the, of these wise sayings, but what one of them. And the, the one that we're going to hone in on is going to talk about and bring up one of the most prominent characters in all of the book of Proverbs. And that character is none other than the sluggard. That the sluggard, he's, he's mentioned 14 times in the entire book of Proverbs, and he's mentioned once here in chapter 24 here this morning in verses 30 through 34. And so some common synonyms for this word sluggard would be lazy, would be procrastinator, would be inactive, would be slothful. And so don't get me wrong, especially through this entire sermon, there, there's a time and a place to take a break. Like there's a time and a place for rest. There's a time and a place to take a nap. There's a time and a place for vacation. But the problem with the sluggard is that it's just not a time and a place for all those things. Like that's his entire life. Like his whole life is a vacation. His whole life is a nap. His whole life is, is a break. And this is huge, right? Especially for the culture in which we live in today. Like in some ways, our culture and, and us in this room, we're busier than we've ever been. While at the same time, we're lazier than we've ever been. Like all at the same time. And there's a whole lot of reasons for that, I think. Like one reason would be, would be these little smartphones, right? Screens, smartphones. Like our phones, our, our screens, they, they haven't made us smarter, Right? They've made us lazier. Like, how many hours, just think about that. Your phone will tell you a bit. How many hours have you wasted just scrolling through your phone day in and day out, just through social media, through watching Netflix, whatever that might be? Not only that, but have, have y'all heard of this whole thing called delayed adolescence? Delayed adolescence, do you know what that is? That's when a 30-year-old is still live, he, he's living like he's still 10. Like that's delayed adolescence. He's got a 30-year-old body, but he still lives like he's a 10-year-old. Still entertainment-driven, irresponsible, self-centered, lazy, 12-year-old, 10-year-old little boy who still plays with toys and has little to no aspirations in life. Delayed adolescence, just putting putting off adulthood until, until he's like 30 or 40 years old. Or if some of y'all have heard of the, the 80-20 rule in, in many churches, it's where 20% of the people in the church do 80% of the work, and 80% of the people in the church like literally do, do nothing. Like there's a whole lot of other examples that could be given here, but you get the idea, right? This, this whole idea of a sluggard, he's not just a theoretical character in the book of Proverbs, but if we're not careful, if we're not intentional, if we're not proactive, then the reality is we can become just like, just like him. And so then I know, like we've already addressed this, this whole idea of sluggard and laziness a little bit in our sermon series in the book of Proverbs, in, all the way back in chapter 6. It was like one point of, of a three-point long sermon. But, but this character of, of the sluggard, he's so prominent in the book of Proverbs. Like it doesn't seem to do it justice if we just focus on one little point of one sermon. But instead, this character is so prominent in the book of Proverbs, it seems like 
it's, we should devote an entire sermon to this whole character of a sluggard. So that's what we're going to do here this morning. That what we're going to see within our passage and really other verses in the book of Proverbs is we're going to see eight characteristics of a sluggard. And these, these characteristics aren't just found here in chapter 24 like I just mentioned. Instead, we're going to see mentioned in, verses, in chapter 24 and verses 30 through 34, but we're also going to look at some other places within the book of Proverbs to give us a, a fuller picture and a glimpse of these characteristics of a sluggard. But as we do this, here's what I want, you, want us to do. As we go through these eight characteristics, I want, I want you to ask the question, like, is this me? Is, is this me? Is this describing me? And if so, then the next question to ask would be, okay, then in what areas of life is this describing me? So is this describing me when it comes to my job? Is this me when it comes to home and, and being with my family? Is this me at school? Is this me in my personal spiritual disciplines, in my, in my walk with Christ? Is this me at church? Is this me in my finances? Is this me in my physical exercise? Is this in me? Is this me in just fill in the blank for yourself? In what ways are these characteristics of a sluggard true of you? And in what areas of, of life are they true of you? After we look at those characteristics, then we're going to conclude with this question. Okay? I, I see, see how I resemble this sluggard in, in this way, in this way, in this way. Okay, then how, how should we respond? How, how should I respond then? Like if I'm a sluggard in, in these two or, or three different ways, then, then in these specific different areas of life, then, then how should I respond to this reality? What, sh what, should I, what should I do? So that's where we're headed during our time together this morning. Eight characteristics of sluggard, kind of evaluating our lives in, the, in regards to these characteristics. And then in light of that, then how should we respond in light of how we resemble sluggard in some of these specific different ways. So eight characteristics of a sluggard. The first characteristic is this. See it on your hand out there. And don't nudge anybody when we're going through these characteristics. Like don't give anybody that look or cough, you know, or whatever. Like let, let, let this individual deal with it themselves. They don't need your help. Everybody with me? Okay. Number one. You put things off and procrastinate. Okay? All right. See this in chapter 24. Look at verse 30. Verse 30. It says in verse 30, I passed by the field of a sluggard, by the vineyard of a man lacking sense. And behold, it was all overgrown with thorns. The ground was covered with nettles, and its stone wall was broken down. So get the picture. Here you have Solomon. He's out for a walk. And as he's out for this walk, he passes by this field, this vineyard of a sluggard. And this field, he says, is overgrown with thorns. Its ground is covered with, with nettles. It's stone wall that's surrounding the field here. It's broken down. In other words, what he's describing is this overgrown dump that he's passing by on his walk. And as he looks at this overgrown lump, uh, overgrown dump, he, 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 he learns this lesson as he looks at this overgrown dump. And look at the lesson that he learns. We see it in verse 32. He says, Then I saw and considered it. I looked and I received instruction. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you like a robber and want like an armed man. And so then this is exactly what happened to this sluggard, right? That instead of going out every day and taking care of this field and his vineyard, what did he do? He just kept putting it off. He just kept putting it off so he could just lay around, put his feet up, and just take it easy and not do anything. And as a result of putting it off day in and day out, day after day after day, all these weeds, all these thorns had grown up, killing the crops and not leaving any room for the crops to grow. And since no crops could grow, then the sluggard had nothing to eat and nothing to sell uh, to others for income. And so then as a result, since he didn't have anything to eat, and since he didn't have anything to sell for income, as a result, poverty came upon him like an armed robber. Why? All because he was lazy. Because he procrastinated. He would rather sit around, take it easy, and relax, and not do anything, than go out and work into his field. And he put it off day in, day 
after day after day. We see the same thing in chapter 20. Look there with me real quick. Turn to chapter 20 and verse 4. Chapter 20, verse 4 says, The slugger does not plow in the autumn. He will seek at harvest and have nothing. So again, when you're supposed to plant and plow is in the autumn. It's when you're supposed to plow your field. But the slugger doesn't do that. And as a result, nothing grows. He has nothing to harvest when it's harvest time. So then again, he, he procrastinates. He, he puts it off. He doesn't get around to doing it. And as a result, what happens? His field is empty, and he doesn't have anything to eat. And so then again, let's, let's not just make the, the slugger this theoretical character in the book of Proverbs, but think about if, if any of us can relate to this here. Like, like, what is this for you? Think about that. Like, what responsibilities in your life have you put off? And you keep putting off and putting off and putting off. What responsibilities in your life have you neglected that you need to address, that you need to be more faithful in, that you need to be more disciplined in, that you need to be more diligent in, but you just, put, you just keep putting it off and off and off? Like for some, it might be reading your Bible. You just keep neglecting it and putting it off and off and off. For others, it might be physical exercise. Yeah, you know, you know, you know, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you just keep putting it off and off and off. For others, it might be investing in a certain friendship, investing in a certain relationship. You just keep neglecting it and putting off and off and off and off. And before you know it, weeds are growing up, thorns are growing up, harvest time comes, you have nothing to show for it because you just kept putting it off and off and off. Second characteristic then of a sluggard is this. You make up excuses for not doing things. You make up excuses for not doing things. We see this in chapter 26. Turn there with me real quick. Chapter 26, verse 13. That you'll notice here in chapter 26, there's, there's this cluster of Proverbs in chapter 26 that are all focused on the sluggard. And the first one is in verse 13 here. And verse 13 says, The sluggard says, There is a lion in the road. There is a lion in the streets. If you turn to the left a few chapters over in chapter 22, Verse 13, then we see the same excuse being made by the sluggard. Chapter 22, verse 30, chapter 22, verse 13, excuse me, says, the sluggard says, there is a lion outside, I should be killed in the streets. And so back in that day, there, there were lions, like lions existed in ancient Israel. But the likelihood of a lion showing up in the middle of town taking just a nice little stroll through the streets, we're like slim to none. And so then, do you, do you see what the sluggard is doing here? He's coming up with like the most far-fetched, remote possibility, most ridiculous excuse that he can come up with to keep from working, to keep from fulfilling the responsibilities that he has. Like again, there's, there's, a, there's a like point Two, five percent, I don't know, I didn't necessarily research this, but remote possibility that a lion could potentially, possibly show up strolling down the street. But it's not enough of a possibility for him to call in sick to work, right? Instead, he, he's just coming up with some lame excuse to be able to, to keep from working, so he doesn't have to work and fulfill the responsibilities he's been given. So then think about this, right? Do you ever do this? Is, is this you? Do, you? do you come up with excuses, even the most remote possible situation that could ever happen and using that as an excuse for not doing something? And so think about that, right? Think about that when it comes to church. Like maybe there's a certain ministry in the church that you know you should be involved in, that you know you should serve in, but you keep coming with all, up with all these excuses for why you shouldn't do it. Or maybe there's someone in the church that God has laid on your heart to disciple or to call and invite over for dinner or to invest in more deeply, but you come up with all these, all these excuses to justify and to give reason for not doing it. Or kids, 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 do you ever 
come up with excuses like there's certain chores you're to do at home. And every time you're asked to do those chores, your feet just magically all of a sudden start hurting. Your arm just magically like falls off. You know, and you can't, you, you come up with all these crazy excuses for not doing them. We're good at that. Third characteristic of a sluggard is this. You love to sleep too much. You love to sleep too much. Again, that's what we see in chapter 26. Look there again with me in verse 14. It says, as a door turns on its hinges, so does a sluggard on his bed. So we know a door, right? It, it turns back and forth on its, on its, on its hinges. That's what a sluggard is like in bed. He's, he's hinged, he's attached to his bed. He just swings back and forth in his bed. It's the, it's the most he moves all day, just being tossed to and fro, just stuck to that bed. So again, please hear this. There's nothing wrong with sleep. I thought I would get an amen there, but there's nothing wrong with sleep. Like God created us to, created us to sleep. We have limits. Like sleep is good. Sleep is needed. Yes, an amen to sleep. But the sluggard, he doesn't just sleep. He loves to sleep. He loves to sleep too much. He loves to hit that snooze button. Not once, not twice, not seven times, but over and over and over and over again. He has a hard time getting out of bed. He just wants to stay in bed. He just wants to pull the covers over his head and, and sleep. He'd much rather do that than get out of bed and fulfill the responsibilities that he's been given and, and to be able to to work and, and take care and of all the responsibilities that he has. So again, a good question to ask is, is this you? Do you have a hard time getting out of bed? Do you sleep excessively more than you ought to sleep? Do you use sleep as an excuse, as an escape? Do you sleep as an escape to, to escape from the realities of, and responsibilities of life? Fourth characteristic of a sluggard then is this. It's that you're lazy even in the simple things. Even in the simple things. Again, we see this in chapter 26. Look at verse 15. It says, just picture this. The sluggard buries his hand in the dish, but it wears him out to bring it back to his mouth. We, we see a similar proverb in chapter 19, verse 24. Look there real quick. It says, the sluggard buries his hand in the dish, and will not even bring it back to his mouth. And so then in that day, utensils weren't really around. They, they, no, no like forks and spoons and, and all that stuff. And so you just reached into the dish and you, you, you ate out of the dish. And so the slugger then is too lazy to bring his hand from the dish to his mouth. Like, I didn't get a ruler out or tape measure to figure out how, how far that was, but I don't know. We're probably talking, what, 12, 15 inches? And he's too lazy to move his hand 12 to 15 inches and open his mouth and eat. And I know, like, that, that sounds ridiculous. And that's kind of the point. It is ridiculous. Like, he's lazy even in the easy things. He's lazy even in the simple things. And so like before we roll our eyes and think, golly, how, that sluggard, I mean, he can't reach out of the dish to his, his mouth and, and eat. Well, do you change the toilet paper? <laughs> Don't look at anybody. I, do, do you load the dishwasher? Or just leave that dish 12, 15 inches from that dishwasher. What about laundry? Like clothes just all over the floor, 12, 15 inches to the, to the laundry basket, you know? Sluggards are lazy, even in the easy, the, the simple things. Fifth characteristic of a sluggard is this. You think you're smarter than everyone else, even though you don't do anything. 
You think you're smarter than everyone else even though you don't do anything. You see this in, the, in chapter 26 again in that cluster of Proverbs there on the sluggard. Chapter 26, verse 16, look there. It said, the sluggard is wiser in his own eyes than seven men who can answer sensibly. What, what that means there is that, that the sluggard doesn't do anything, that even though the sluggard doesn't do anything, he thinks he knows everything. You, you know people like that? They think they're smarter than, than they think they're smarter than everybody, but they're unwilling to do anything. It's like this armchair quarterback, right? Never played quarterback in his life. But he can tell you everything about it. And he can tell you how to do it. And he can criticize who, everybody who's not doing it the right way. And so then think about, the, are, are there areas in your life in which this is true of you? In which you know a lot of things. You think you're smarter than everyone else. But the reality is you're all talk. Because when you look at the reality of what your life and what you've accomplished and what you've done, you haven't done jack squat. You're just really smart. But you haven't done anything. That's the life of the sluggard. Which then leads to six characteristic, which is this. You have a lot of dreams and desires, but nothing to show for them. You have a lot of dreams and desires, but nothing to show for them. We see this in chapter 21. Look at Chapter 21, real quick, in verse 25. It says, The desire of the sluggard kills him, for his hands refuse to labor. If you turn over to chapter 13, we see a very similar proverb. Chapter 13, verse 4, it says, The soul of the sluggard craves and gets nothing, while the soul of the diligent is richly supplied. So then both of these Proverbs talk about the sluggard craving, talk about the sluggard desiring. And, but it also talks about how even though the sluggard craves for things, even though the sluggard desires things, it says he never gets them. He, 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 gets, he gets nothing. He's craving, he, he's desiring, but he, he never gets what he craves. He never gets what he desires. And do you know why that is? It's because he's lazy. He, he craves, he desires these things, but he's so lazy he's not willing to put in the work and the effort and the time and the energy to get what he desires and to get what he craves. And that's the point of these two Proverbs here. You can desire something all you want. You can have all the dreams you want. You can have all the desires you want of this and this and that. Like you can want, you can dream and desire to be a better dad. You can dream and desire to be a better friend. You can dream and desire to be a more faithful church member. You can dream and desire to have a certain job or a certain position at work, or have certain grades in school, or be involved in a certain type of ministry. But the reality is dreams and desires and cravings and longings in and of themselves aren't going to get you anything. You still got to work. You still got to put in the effort. Like the sluggard has a whole list of unfulfilled desires. Oh, he desires, he craves, but he's got nothing to show for him because he's lazy and, un, un, and is unwilling to work for him. Seventh characteristic of sluggard, just this. Your laziness has filled your life with all kinds of trouble and difficulties. Your laziness has filled your life with all kinds of troubles and difficulties. See this in chapter 15. Look there with me real quick. In verse 19. Chapter 15, verse 19 says, The way of a sluggard is like a hedge of thorns, but the path of the upright is a level highway. So what this proverb is doing, it's contrasting the way or, or the path or the, the road of the sluggard with the, ro with the way and the path and the road of the upright. And the upright's the diligent person, the disciplined person. And so then if you notice here, the, the upright, the, the disciplined person, they're not lazy. So then what do they do? They, they walk their path every day. And because they walk their path every day, all the weeds, all the grass, all the flowers, all the thorn, all those things, they've been matted down. Because the diligent person, the upright person just walks back and forth on that path every day. 
So then his path has become a smooth, it's a, it's a level path, it's a level highway for him to walk now. When it comes to the sluggard though, his path is like a hedge of thorns. And the reason thorns have grown up on his path is because the sluggard never walks on his path. Instead, he's still in bed. He's still at home just laying around with his feet up. He's taking it easy. And so then his path now is filled with all these thorns. And this is the analogy then of, of the sluggard's life. Because of his laziness, then his life is filled with all these thorns, meaning all these troubles, all these hardships, all these difficulties. And so then if you're lazy in school, then the thorns that you're going to get are, are bad grades. If you're lazy at work, then the thorns that you're going to get are, is, is getting fired or not getting the job that you desire. If you're lazy with your finances, then the thorns that you're going to get are financial trouble. If you're lazy in your relationships with others, then the thorns that you're going to get are conflict and loneliness. If you're lazy in your marriage, then the thorns you're going to get are an unhealthy marriage. Like this is what happens when you neglect, when you neglect these things. When you neglect things that you should neglect. Thorns grow up and cause all kinds of trouble and pain and difficulty in your life or in your path, in your, in your journey of life. So then leads to this eighth and final characteristic of a sluggard, which is this. It's that you aren't reliable and others have a hard time depending upon you. You aren't reliable and others have a hard time depending upon you. We see this in, the, in chapter 10. Look there with me. Chapter 10, verse 26. It says, like vinegar to the teeth, and smoke to the eyes, so is the sluggard to those who send him. So this, this, this proverb, it's comparing a sluggard to vinegar to the teeth and, and smoke to the eyes. In other words, just like vinegar irritates one's teeth and smoke irritates one's eyes, so a sluggard irritates those who send him on an errand. Sluggard irritates those who, who send the sluggard out to fulfill a certain task or are counting on him to fulfill a certain responsibility. And, the, and the, the reason that the person is irritated by them is because the, he, he's counting on him. He's counting on the sluggard to do this or to do that or fulfill their, the task or the responsibility that he sent him to do. But the sluggard doesn't do it because he's lazy and he'd rather just sit back and relax and sleep than fulfill the responsibility that he's been given for what he's been sent to do. And because of that, then, the person that sent him is, is irritated by him. Just like smoke irritates our eyes. And because of that, that person then can't depend upon the sluggard. That person can't rely upon the sluggard to do what he's asked him to do. Can't depend upon him and can't rely upon him because he's too lazy. So then, the question there is, can, can people rely upon you? Are, are you dependable? Like at work, can your, can your boss rely upon you to do what you've, he's asked you to do or what she's asked you to do? At home, can your spouse, can your kids depend upon you? As a church, can other members of this church rely upon you and depend upon you to fulfill the responsibilities and commitments that you've made to them? Are you reliable? Are you dependable in those ways? So these are, these are eight characteristics here of a sluggard that we see here in the book of Proverbs. So here's what I want you to do, just real quick, before we move on to the next, kind of this concluding section, would be this. I want you to look and see on these eight characteristics and see which of these best describe you. And I want you to literally like circle, circle them. Like which of these best, best, describes, best describes you. And then beside those, I want you to write down what area of life is this most prominent in? What area of your life is this most prominent in? In other words, you, you might not be a sluggard when it comes to your job, but you might be a sluggard when it comes to your family. You might not be a sluggard when it comes to your physical exercise, but you might be a sluggard when it comes to church. 
And so just because one of these characteristics characterize you doesn't mean that you're a sluggard in every area of your life in this way. For most of us, it's pretty selective. And so as you identify which of these characteristics must characterize you, then jot down beside them what area of life. Is it your job? Is it school? Is it marriage? Is it your spiritual life? Is it church? Is it your finances? Or whatever else that might be for you. Which then begs this question. All right, you, you got me. Yeah, you, you pinned me down. I'm, I'm guilty as charged. You know, I'm, I'm not perfect. I, I'm a sluggard, at least a little bit, in three out of these eight ways. I, I don't know. Okay, what do I do then? Like, how, how do I respond? Do I just, you just went through this exercise to make me feel bad? Well, you, good job. You did that, you know? What do I do? How, how do I respond? How do I dress? How do I put to death? How do I kill the sluggard in my heart? Well, here are three ways to respond to the sluggard in your heart. And the first is this. It's to repent of your selfish, self-centered heart. To repent of your selfish, self-centered heart. And think about this, right? Like this right here is the real root of laziness, isn't it? Like this is, the, this is the real root of laziness. In other words, your ultimate problem isn't laziness. Like laziness isn't your ultimate problem. Instead, laziness is simply a symptom of a deeper root issue and deeper root problem in your heart. And that deeper root problem is that you're really, really selfish. You're really, really self-centered. You're self-absorbed. You worship yourself. You love yourself a whole, whole lot. And that's the real root of laziness. That when we're lazy, what's happening is that we're loving ourselves more than we love God and more than we love other people. So then instead of getting up and serving your spouse, instead of getting up and playing with your kids, you scroll through your phone instead. Why? Because you love yourself more than you love them. Or instead of working hard at your job, you give it your bare minimum. Why? Because you love yourself more than you love those you're serving in your job. And so this is what laziness, what it ultimately comes down to. Like laziness ultimately comes down to a decision. And that decision is this. Am I going to love and worship myself right now? Or am I going to love and worship the Lord right now and love others right now? So here's the point. If you want to address the sluggard in your heart, don't address the issue of laziness. Instead, if you want to address the, issue, the sluggard in your heart, address the issue of selfishness in your selfish, self-centered, self-absorbed heart. Second way to respond to the sluggard in our hearts is this. It's to repent of your idolatry. To repent of your idolatry. And I use that word there, idolatry here, on purpose. Because this is what we've made rest. This is what we've made laziness. We've made it into an idol. Like this is what we live for. This is what we long for. This is what we dream about. Like, we, we live for pleasure. We live to be entertained. We live for comfort. We live for fun. And again, there's, there's nothing wrong with any of those things. Again, it's important to stop. It's important to take a break. It's important to rest in all of those things. But it's not okay to make these things your God. And that's the problem. That's why people live for the weekend. Why? They put in Monday through Friday so they can get to the weekend because that's where fun is. That's where pleasure is. That's where they can be entertained and just indulge all of their selfish desires. That's why people live and long for retirement. They want to get to this day in which there's no more work and there's no more responsibility and they can just indulge themselves. We've made rest. We've made laziness an idol in our hearts. Biblically speaking, we, biblically speaking, the, the, the rhythms that you see in the Bible 
are these. We're to rest so that we can work. In the culture in which we live in today, we twisted it. And now we work so we can rest. You don't find that in the Bible. Third way to respond then. So repent of your selfishness, repent of your idolatry, and the third most important way to respond is is this. It's to preach the gospel to yourself. To preach the gospel to yourself. In other words, yes, go go through those eight characteristics of a sluggard and reflect upon how your life resembles these characteristics in the life of a sluggard. That's important. Yes, do that. And yes, see the selfishness, see the self-centeredness as the root of your laziness in your heart. And see how how when you're lazy, you're loving yourself and worshiping yourself more than you're loving others. Yes, do that. And yes, see the idolatry in your heart and see how you've made laziness and slothfulness and and rest into a God. So yes, do that. And as you do all that, feel the weight of the reality of what in the world is going on in your heart and the ugliness of your heart. Let these things expose the ugly reality of your heart. At the same time, Don't stop there. Instead, after you see the ugliness of your heart, then preach the gospel to yourself. In other words, remember that even though you resemble the sluggard in all these different ways, Jesus doesn't. Jesus isn't a sluggard. Instead, when you were selfish and self-centered and lazy and dead in your sin, Jesus didn't procrastinate. Jesus didn't put anything off. Jesus didn't make up excuses. Jesus didn't stay in bed. Jesus didn't stay on the couch scrolling through his phone. Instead, when you were selfish and self-centered and you were a lazy sluggard, Jesus came to this earth and he got to work. He got to work. That the night before Jesus died, he went to the Garden of Gethsemane. And what did he do? He worked long and hard in prayer so much so that the Bible says that his sweat became like drops of blood. After being beaten in and flogged, then he, he drug himself. He, he drug himself on that road as he carried a crossbeam to the place that he was going to be crucified. And when he got there, then he was nailed to that cross and he was hoisted up. And when everyone saw him and looked at him, everyone thought that he was just dying. But the reality is he wasn't just dying, he was working. He was working to save you and he was working to save me. He was substituting himself in our place and taking the punishment that we deserve for all of our laziness and all of our selfishness and all of our idolatry and all of our sin. Like we're the ones who deserve to be condemned. We're the ones who deserve to be judged. We're the ones who deserve God's wrath to be poured out upon us because we're the ones who are selfish, self-centered, idolatrous sluggards. But Jesus substituted himself in our place and took the judgment that we deserve for our sin. So then even though it didn't look like it, even though it just looked like Jesus was dying on that cross, he wasn't just dying on that cross. He was working. He was working to save you, and he was working to save me, and he was working to save anyone and everyone who would repent of their sins and trust in Jesus' work on the cross for their salvation. Like right there then is how we combat and wage war against the sluggard in our hearts. We wage war against the laziness in our hearts by remembering the gospel and by remembering Jesus' work for us. In other words, in those times, you don't feel like serving anybody other than yourself. And when all you want to do is just lay around and stay in bed and scroll through your phone and live for your own comfort and convenience and pleasure and entertainment, then in those times, preach the gospel. In those times, remember the gospel. And remember how much Jesus has served you, how much Jesus has worked for you and loved you and cared for you. Because when you remember that, then you won't stay in bed. You won't pull up those covers over your head. You won't binge watch Netflix for hours upon hours. You won't just mindlessly scroll through your phone anymore. You just won't sit on the couch and lay around and live for yourself. 
You won't live for yourself and your own comfort and your own pleasure and your own entertainment and convenience anymore. Instead, when you preach the gospel to yourself, you'll want to live now a life of worship and you want to live a life that loves Jesus. You want to live a life that wants to get to know this Jesus. And as you do that, then do you know what will happen? Then your heart will begin to begin to reflect his. And instead of sitting on the couch, you'll want to get up and you'll want to serve others just like he has served you. And you'll want to go to work, and you'll want to work hard because you see work as being more than just a place to earn money. You see work as a place to love and serve others with the gifts that God has given you, just as Jesus has served and loved you. And you'll want to read the Bible. You'll want to pray because there's no one else that you want to spend time with and think about other than Jesus. Like there's a little bit of a sluggard in, in all of our hearts But the way you put that sluggard to death and crucify that sluggard is by repenting of your selfishness, repenting of your idolatry, and preaching the good news of Jesus to that sluggard in your heart. Let me pray for us. Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the conviction of your word that leaves us all guilty that these characteristics of a sluggard isn't just this colorful character written about in the book of Proverbs, that in so many ways and on so many levels, it's us in this room. And because of that, Lord, we, we deserve your judgment, not simply because of our laziness, but because of what that laziness reveals and exposes about our hearts. We love ourselves a lot. We worship ourselves a lot. We've we've made ourselves into a God and our laziness into a God. That we look to for ultimate fulfillment and ultimate satisfaction in this life. We've made heaven into laziness. Laziness into our heaven that we long for. And so God, I pray that as we're convicted of that, Lord, I pray that we would be reminded of the hope that we have in Jesus, that we we would be thankful that Jesus isn't a sluggard, that we would be thankful that Jesus worked for us, that Jesus worked to save us even to the point of death on a cross. And I pray that the reality of his mercy, his grace, his forgiveness that he has lavished upon us would cause our mouths and our jaws to drop in awe and amazement in worship, cause our hearts to be overwhelmed with gratefulness and praise to you, and would cause our feet and our hands to get up and work and to serve and to love and to care and invest in people just as Jesus has done the same for us. That we do these things not simply so we can check a box and say, and get rid of our guilty conscience and, feel, and say that, hey, we're not a sluggard. But we do these things because we're compelled to. Because our hearts have met Jesus. And our hearts resemble the heart of Jesus. And as a result, our lives and our work ethic do as well. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.